A very good evening to one and all present. Welcome to a new episode of View TV by Vijay Bhumi. Uh, this is again an episode which is part of our masterclass series. Uh, it is uh, today we're going to be discussing how to crack the LSAT India exam in this masterclass series. It is my privilege and my honor to welcome our guest speaker of the day, Mr. Pulkit Goyal. So till after class 12 board exams, Pulkit was looking at illustrious options in the areas of data sciences and even made it through some of the top universities uh, globally. Um, and well, like many of us do have these Eureka moments in life and we decide to, you know, uh, take these very different uh, routes. So while speaking to one of his friends in a coffee shop, Pulkit sort of realized that actually law was his calling. Um, and he sort of recounted that, you know, how while he was at school, he completely enjoyed debating and MUNs. And hence, that's how he ended up, you know, deciding on choosing law as a career option. And that's when his journey with the law started. Uh, he ended up cracking the LSAT and how he was ranked number one in the LSAT India exam la uh, last year. And now currently he's pursuing his law at Jindal Global Law School. So welcome, Pulkit. Thank you so much for taking out your time to be with us this evening. Uh, thank you, Kritika, for that illustrious, illustrious introduction. And it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I sort of enjoy uh, teaching people. <laughs> Uh, is this, this uh, something I like doing? Super. That sounds great. Uh, so I would like to tell all of our audience members who have joined us today, please make sure you're asking us a lot of questions. As you all know, the LSAT India exam is hardly two weeks away. I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of doubts about, you know, last minute preparation, hacks, etc. So make sure that you ask us a lot of questions in the chat box because I will be taking them in our audience Q&A round and I will be posing all of those questions to Pulkit. So without further ado, let's start into this conversation with Pulkit. So Pulkit, I think first it's really important for us to talk about are there any sort of changes in the LSAT India paper from last year to this year? If yes, then uh, what are the changes? There is one very significant change actually. So. Till last year, there were only four sections in the paper, two of which were critical reasoning. One was reading comprehension and one was analytical reasoning. So this year, they sort of added a dummy section. All right. So it's an unmarked section uh, because, okay, so the ELSA does not have negative marking as such. So feel free to fluke uh, and uh, guess as many answers if you want to. But uh, they just added a section that won't be marked. You won't know which section it, it is. So there'll be five sections now. One of them won't be marked, so just to like decrease the number of people uh, who get good ranks because of flukes and all. So this increases the number of questions. Right. So actually, Pulkit, you know, before we talk about in detail about, you know, how to crack each section and we go over questions and more your approach to questions, I think can we just break down a little bit for everybody who's joining us today that what are the various sections in the paper? What is the time allotted to each section? Mm -hmm. What kind of topics are covered under each section? So if you can just sort of give them a okay. skeletal sort of uh, brief skeletal structure of the LSAT India paper. Okay, so this will be one paper where I guarantee you, you will not be short of time. So uh, the minutes are more than the number of questions you have, which is sort of rev revolutionary when it comes to law exams in our country. Uh, so, and there's section wise time limit. So it's not like you have two hours and you have these many questions, do it, do it in whichever order you want to, that won't work. So there'll be five sections, uh, 35 minutes per each section. And okay. So here's the interesting thing about LSAT. The number of questions is never fixed. All right. There's a range within which they vary around, um, uh, so on average, the minimum number of questions you will have in a section is around 25 to 29. And uh, you have 35 minutes uh, per section. Uh, so that's 35 into five. That's 175 minutes. The, your paper is almost going to be three hours long. You have to do five sections. It's a long, long paper. And the main thing you're going to be tested on is reading uh, and your English, uh, not vocabulary or grammar, but just how well you, you comprehend it. And the various things that are tested, it's <laughs> again, a wide variety. No prior knowledge of the law, no prior knowledge of honestly anything. We don't read current affairs uh, like I 
or if you're not really you don't really know the law which you're not expected to know anyway at this stage you're just applying right so as long as you're good at comprehending you should be fine because so the passages will vary from let's say passages passages just published in scientific journals about a new quark being discovered to something about a discovery of fossils uh made to something to some even a uh, very philosophical one some someone would be talking about jack derrida and deconstruction and how it works uh to even literary critics uh like a review of a book or a short literary review being done by someone so it's just so the depth and the breadth of it is quite wide at the same time you really don't need to know these things uh to be able to do it and this is mainly in the reading comprehension section in the critical reasoning section it will be much easier because again shorter paragraphs and they'll be more like arguments an argument can be on literally anything under the sun there will be scientific arguments there will there might even be a legal argument uh a lot of it would be politicians talking how politicians talk and all that so yeah like as far as the topics covered go it's wide but at the same time you don't really need to know those topics to be, be to be able to do well in them okay and uh, if you can also sort of tell me like you did emphasize quite a bit that you know this paper is also like very content heavy so there's a lot of reading that needs to be done so uh, usually you know students and aspirants have this in the mind that how can they improve their reading speed so are there any you know hacks that you have as to how you know okay there is this book i would actually recommend uh, okay so don't hold me uh, it's a nice book i myself haven't finished it completely but uh, i've been i've done half of it and it helps like it's helping me in college so in college you're you're going you're going to read a lot all right and every and anyone here who's very uncomfortable with an online exam happening trust me this is how law school exam should be all your reading is going to be on a laptop or your ipad right so this this is a medium you really need to get used to so uh that's a piece of advice get used to reading things on your laptop your phone and your ipads it will really come in handy and uh uh how you increase your reading speed right one of it is just practice but practicing without knowing what to do won't uh earn you a lot of points so one of my like a uh, hack if i have to say but it's not an instant success hack like today i tell you next day your reading speed goes from 200 to 400 words per minute not going to happen it's it will take some practice but i think you can do it in a week is using your peripheral vision to read all right so let's say there's a line with uh six words in it uh, a lot of us because especially for us english is a second language not something we frequently use at home not something we frequently use with friends uh, it's more for us we mainly use english in a very formal setting and as a result we are not uh, very used to uh, reading english some of you might be again i personally when i started i was not so we tend to read word by word or right, let's say uh, the sentence is a uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog the very interesting fact about this sentence it has every letter in the english lexicon uh, i'm very interested in some weird awkward facts but so we might read this as uh, the quick brown fox and your eyes would move from the quick brown fox but instead if you just focus on the word quick to begin with you can read the quick brown at the same time uh, mm-hmm. and then you focus on the word jump you can read uh, fox jumps over at the same time so you decrease your eye movements the number of times you move your eyes yeah that automatically brings up your reading speed and you realize you don't have to read every word you will uh, you will realize yeah. the more you do this the more you start skimming the more you realize something is important the more you focus there so don't uh, be very finicky about reading every word or understanding everything especially in this exam there will be passages you won't understand complete passages you won't understand doesn't matter honestly does not matter you can still crack the questions So you know, apart from that, I think uh, what about what are the broad topics that are tested in the analytical reasoning and the logical reasoning section? If you can kind of okay. break it down. Yeah, yeah. So analytical reasoning, they only have one kind of questioning. Uh, I don't know what you guys call that question because every coaching center I know calls that question something else. It's uh, it's called from what uh, the thing I've used, the thing I've heard being used most uh, most frequently is paneling. so they'll give you a set of objects a data set basically let's say five names uh but yes they'll give you a data set of like uh 
five names, five objects, anything. Let's uh, most of the time it'll be A, B, C, D, E, different names starting with A, B, C, D, E. Right? And they'll give you certain conditions. Like, like if A goes, B has to go. If B is there, C cannot be there. And then the question would be uh, of a sort like, uh, which of this is a probable sequence of people who go? Yeah. Right. And you just have to keep applying the conditions and cancel each one out and you arrive at the right one. One important thing, uh, I'll talk more about this when I do the sample question, is uh, if, uh, it, uh, things don't necessarily have to be true. That This is one uh, big break between uh, CLAT, ELIT, and LSAT. In CLAT and ELIT, when you're solving puzzles and all, you're always looking for things that are always definitely true, not a possibility. Whereas in LSAT, most of your questions are going to be possibility. Which of these is a possible solution to the uh, to the question? So that might throw a lot of people off who are not used to these kind of questions. Uh, but is that uh, analytical reasoning? And logical reasoning is completely critical reasoning. So weaken an argument, strengthen an argument. Uh, what's a flaw in the argument? What's the conclusion? What's the most logical inference uh, based on short, short passages? And, you know, I think the other question that, you know, when you talk about any exam, I mean, in this case, we're talking about the LSAT India exam, students are always wondering, you know, where do we source our questions from? So if you can sort of look down that, what are the sources that you used for, you know, practicing questions for various sections, if there were any books you were following, and also uh, I think the same that you'd like to talk about coaching, because I think this is, again, another thing, Miss Norma, that a lot of students have that, you know, if you go for coaching, only then, you know, you can sort of get past. Uh, okay, so I'll say a few things on this. Uh, let's start with where you can source your questions from. There are a lot of sample LSAT papers on then because understand it's a it's an exam that's been going on in America for a lot of time, decades now, right? And you have a lot of sample papers from the US and it's the same kind of questions, right? It's the same same uh, kind of questions you get in the LSAT India. Of course, because the US exam is a PG exam, so the difficulty is a bit notched up. Even the questions I've prepared for uh, all the aspirants here are questions from the LSAT US because I honestly believe that working uh, on the LSAT US, if you get used to those level of questions, the LSAT India is going to be a, a walk in the park for you. And... Uh, uh, this is one of the things uh, someone has told me. I personally did not use this resource. Uh, was uh, Khan Academy? A lot of you might be uh, might know what Khan Academy is, especially those of you who are studying science in 11th and 12th. You might have used a lot of their resources. Uh, they have a specific section for the LSAT, which is designed for the LSAT uh, LSAT US. Uh, they have all the kind of questions, all tips and tricks, and how to approach these questions. I personally, the resources I use were sample papers. LSAT India also offers like a collection of 10 sample papers to go through. If you do those 10 sample papers and if you do them religiously in the sense you go over your mistakes and see where you went wrong, uh, the actual exam will be very easy. So the official guide should be enough. However, if you guys feel that you need something more or maybe you're not able to get to the official guide or if you're done with the official guide already and like, what more can I do? Uh, so I'd recommend uh, at least for critical reasoning because a lot of LSAT material isn't available in India. Uh, look for GMAT books. All right, the, uh, the GMAT has an office. GMAT also releases official uh, books. So they get their official verbal review. It will have a good number of CR questions. Again, remember those CR questions are going to be tougher than the ones you would be doing in LSAT India because again, GMAT is a PG exam for uh, business administration. So the level would be higher, but uh, for CR questions, that's a good resource. Paneling questions, uh, I haven't personally come across books in India. However, uh, uh, there are a lot of books by, uh, there's this institute called Manhattan Prep. Uh, it primarily functions again in the US and they have a lot of books with for analytical for the analytical reasoning questions. Try and finding PDFs of these books online. Uh, I know a few sites, but they aren't completely legal, so I won't. Uh, say it here, but uh, I'll leave my contact information at the end, like an email address. Feel free to contact me and I'll supply you with the books. No issues. Sounds good. And uh, uh, Coaching Institute. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, Coaching Institute. Uh, so personally, I believe else that's one exam you don't need Coaching Institute for. No, you don't need a Coaching Institute for. Though I personally did have a coaching, I did go to a crash course. I did join a crash course because again, I decided, I decided to do law after my 12th. So I'd say this much. 
a good coaching institute definitely helps you recognize the areas you're good at areas you're weak at gives you good practice and of course mentoring sessions in the sense if you don't understand something you sometimes need someone else to tell you like this is how it will be done and a lot of times you yourself aren't able to do that and you exactly don't have a lot of youtube videos unlike other unlike some subjects which explain you step by step how to do certain question so as far as that goes uh, coaching institutes help you but on the other hand if you don't have a coaching institute i don't think so you are at a inherent disadvantage from people who are at coaching institutes because uh, again what it matters is uh, i okay so for uh, background i probably did better than a lot of people who had been taking coaching for 2 years continuously with i just had like 2 months 3 months of coaching right so coaching is not that important how you make use of your coaching right it's what you, it's what you do that uh, reflects in the coaching so as long as you are working religiously even if it's let's say you feel your coaching is not that great or you're not in a coaching or you feel your coaching is amazing it all boils down to how hard you work alongside your coaching the coaching is only going to help you yeah or uh, all right uh, if anyone wants personal recommendations or question for coachings again email me at the end i'll give you my email email me i can uh, i'll try and help you out with that super so you know like at this point of time uh, everybody also has this doubt right that how many hours should i be putting in like i'm two weeks away from the exam so how many hours in a day should i be putting in to prepare for the exam so if you were in the mm-hmm. place last year like when you were placed yeah, I, I was uh, i was probably in a worse of situation than most most of you all here but again i'll tell you guys one thing and trust me like this is one mantra i live by and this will help you go a long way don't measure what you do by hours or it's never about how many hours i should put in it's about what work you're doing in those hours right yeah. let's uh, take keep a goal for yourself like this is how much i need to do uh, let's take a sample lsat test you were like i need to complete this sample lsat test today like maybe you're just doing it for practice you're not timing yourself your goal is to complete it in the day right don't uh, mm-hmm. it can't be like okay i'm going to study 2 hours a day you start with the test for some reason you're going really slow you're very distracted you only need 15 questions in those two hours i'm like okay i studied two hours i'm done not going to work out uh, not in entrances not in law school not in life have a goal i'm going to uh, let's say even if you start with small goals even having small goals is fine as long as you work towards a goal let's say i'm only going to complete one logical reasoning section of the lsat uh, exam today which is around 25 to 29 questions i'm going to do 25 to 29 questions today do them meticulously religiously and that is how you should go ahead with your prep because at this time you guys would be the best to know where you stand how much practice you need so uh, do it like that like, like trust me there have been days uh, while preparing again i'm not trying to boast or go like oh i'm so great i'm so smart i'm not uh at law school i'm probably one of the most average people you will run into it's all about the amount of hard work you put in there have been days i studied 14 hours continuously uh, and there have been days i've been done in 2 hours right if you're done in 2 hours uh, and you feel like you have more time you can do something more take another goal start working on it if you feel you're on track uh, you're you're personally satisfied relax right don't burn yourself out trust me like else is going to be 3 and a half it's a long paper you need to be fresh you need to be mentally there don't burn yourself out don't compare yourself with others oh my god he's studying 6 hours a day what am i doing with my life no right your only competition is going to be you you know what works best for you you know what kind of goals you can do you know your capabilities everyone's different no one's inherently better if someone can sit at a chair and work for 8 hours straight not inherently better than someone who can work for 2 hours who can who works 2 hours with one hour intervals in between does not make a difference keep goals complete those goals w- within that day do not sleep till you complete your goal last last piece of advice doesn't matter if it's 4 am 5 am 6 am 8 am in the morning you've been awake don't sleep until you complete your goal because once you sleep it means you, you gave up on that goal you're going to start falling behind on those goals it's fine if you sleep at 8 o'clock and then wake up at 2 as long as you completed that goal and then you will start working on your next goal yeah i think that's some really valuable advice that you're giving all of our aspirants and i think it'll be really useful for them at this point of time um also what were you, like how were you dividing your day at this point of time when you were two weeks away from the exam so like did you have mm-hmm. like 
like a set schedule that I'm going to give like two, three hours in a day to reading comprehension or logic. Okay, so mm-hmm. my schedule most of the days was uh, okay. So right now, before two weeks, before a week was a period where I was burnt out. All right. So during this time, at least last year, the CLAT had got over, the ALET had got over, and it was like some a week or two weeks after CLAT ALET, and I was completely burnt out because okay, I understand this is a dude who. had to do 8 months of current affairs in 2 months right just before the clat so somehow uh, obviously did not turn out really well but again i was burnt out completely so i won't tell you what i did uh, during those 2 weeks because i was uh, honestly very less i won't advise you to but i'd actually tell you what i did before those 2 weeks and i was actually preparing so when i was actually preparing uh, my goal an ideal goal in my opinion at this stage if you have been preparing for let's say 6 months 8 months something would be to complete one test paper in year one test paper a day sorry one test paper a day take a sample lsat paper one day complete it whole check your answers and always revisit the answers you got wrong see why you got wrong understand why you got wrong if you do not understand why you got that question wrong uh talk to any of your friends talk to people at your coaching try and please understand like okay so the chances of that question coming in the exam are zero i'll tell you right now every question you're going to see in your sample uh, uh sample else that uh papers is not going to come in the exam but what is repeating is the kind of logic that you you realize there's some uh, recurrent recurring kinds of question a lot of questions would mistake a sufficient condition for a necessary one a lot of questions would equivocate a lot of questions would uh ad hominem attack in the sense they attack the reputation of the speaker and not the argument itself right so it's very in, very important to understand these things so if you get a question wrong that just simply means that you don't understand the particular logic behind that question not the argument you don't need to understand the argument you don't understand the logic behind it so it's very important in my opinion to understand every question you do before the exam obviously in the exam if you get stuck on a question uh guess it move on guess it move on because again no negative marking remember that uh now punkit if you can go on to if you can sort of run your slide presentation and if we if you can you know display a sample question from each section uh and, sure, uh, sure yeah and basically just walk everybody through the way you would solve each of these questions i think it'll be super helpful for yeah. our attendees uh for this i am going to need some engagement from the chat box because this is going to be an exercise now i i realize most of you who weren't uh, did not come to a session with the mind we're going to solve questions uh but sadly this is how i think it would be most effective so it'd be really helpful if all of uh, if all the people in the chat can interact but anyway moving on three at and at any time if you feel the font is too small for because you're on your phone or anything just tell me i'll uh, increase it uh no issues there uh so there are three main types of questions uh, like i said reading comprehension critical reasoning and analytical reasoning which is paneling so this is a sample reading comprehension question tell me if this is too small for you anyone in the chat otherwise i'll just let it be i'll read it with you i'm not going to speak as i read and i'll tell you when i am done we can also sort of i don't know measure our reading speeds like that and then we'll start with the questions i think that's a good idea
Okay, so I am done. It's just comment on the chat box and all of you all are done reading the passage. Anyway, I'll begin in another minute. Okay, so the minute is up. None of you have replied anything on the chat box. I'm presuming all of you all are done reading it. So we can begin with the questions now. The first question is, which one of the following most accurately states the main point of the passage? Okay, so these type of questions are very common. You're gonna see them in almost every passage you do. Uh, not just reading comprehension, even in a lot of re critical reasoning questions. So I'll read out the options. The first option is recent evidence sheds light on Indus Valley civilization calls into question some of the views held previously by archaeologists regarding its significance and decline. So this was there in the passage. If you all read it, you would have realized that first it starts with what the Indus Valley civilization is, then starts hypothesizing why it uh, demised. And there's a view presented uh, by this historian that um, they must have been massacred by the Aryans. And later it's shown there's no signs of battle, hap battle happening. That's unlikely. So, okay, A is a possible answer. Uh, but we should and we must always go through all the options so we can cross out every option before selecting the right one. Remember, this is one exam you're going to have a lot of time for. So the second option is Bronze Age civilizations, uh, including that of the Indus Valley, have not been properly recognized for their cultural achievement. Multiple flaws in this. Uh, it's not talking about Bronze Age civilizations in general. It's just talking about Indus Valley civilization, which is a Bronze Age civilization. Second of all, it does not talk about cultural uh, achievements. Nothing about cultural achievements mentioned anywhere in the passage. C. Indus Valley civilization played an important role in the evolution of democracy and modern agriculture. So yes, it has a point where it says that their system was at least in part democratic and also says that uh, they had a good system of distributing food. But does it necessarily mean it contributed to the modern democratic system? There's nothing which shows that uh, modern democracies were built off of this. In fact, all of these are very recent findings as per uh, the passage, right? So it's very unlikely that this influenced the arrival of modern democracy. For that reason, C is out. D, Indus Valley civilization is a historically significant culture, but there is not enough evidence to draw legitimate conclusions about the cultural practice of the people. Again, nothing about culture in the entire passage. And B, this passage does give us some concrete evidence to infer things, right? It says there are no signs of battle, uh, no division of um, quarters, good system to distribute food. So D is wrong. Uh, last one, certain long and long held assumptions about the decline of the Indus Valley civilization exemplify how scholars can be led to incorrect conclusions by incomplete data. Only one example of this is there. Uh, again, that argument by uh, Wheeler, Mo Mortimer Wheeler. It says certain long held assumptions. There's only one assumption that's being talked about. And we don't know why that was wrong, whether it was because of lack of data, a wrong conjecture, some other uh, evidence that this passage does not talk about. We don't know that. So again, for this reason, E is out. For that reason, A is the correct answer to the first question. Question number two, which one of the following is not cited in the passage as a characteristic of Indus Valley civilization? Largest of the major Bronze Age civilization mentioned, mentioned in the first passage. 
cultivated rice again mentioned when they talk about agriculture it's people were generally nomadic okay this is not mentioned there is a mention that they probably shifted to another region but that's held out as an anomaly as an exception but otherwise it showed that they had very planned elaborate cities so it's unlikely that they were nomadic the major trader mentioned that they traded with mesopotamia uh uh it's unlikely that they traded with the people of mesopotamia they traded with the people of mesopotamia so d is mentioned e was spread across an area that is now part of three nations again this is mentioned so a would be the correct answer for question number 2 Question number three. Based on the passage, which one of the following most accurately describes the author's stance regarding Wheeler's theory? Enthusiastic appreciation does not appreciate. Grudging approval does not approve. Slight disagreement with its assumption and respect. No, there's no respect for its venerable status, and it's arguable whether the disagreement was slight or not. And finally, which one of the following? Uh, and E. Unambiguous rejection of it. in other newly conducted evidence okay a b c d are wrong we all know that e makes sense because it, ha- it he is rejecting it simply by saying that no signs of basit so e is the correct answer here question number 4 which of the following is cited in the passage as evidence that directly counters wheeler's theory now just look for something that says um, no signs of battle right uh, seismically volatile uh, another theory the author himself proposes no finding that indicate battle with bronze age indus valley cities this is one there's a possible answer c there is evidence of severe droughts does not support wheeler d no signs of dominant rulers does not support wheeler and nowhere mentioned in the passage e the indus valley people practiced agriculture does not has nothing to do with what wheeler said so the answer is going to be b uh, no finding that indicate any battle of sorts question 5 the author would be likely to agree with which one of the following statements because the indus valley region is prone to earthquake it is most likely that an earthquake destroys the indus valley civilization again pay close attention to these qualifying verbs such as most right most likely it says it's a possible reason never says it's the most likely b only a disaster as catastrophic as an earthquake would have caused the demise of the indus valley civilization as sophisticated the mass of a civilization as sophisticated as the indus valley civilization possible answer but not a very strong answer in my opinion simply because uh, as disaster uh, a disaster as catastrophic as an earthquake he does not just talk about natural uh, disaster another thing that could have led to it was a massacre by the aryans or just rivers shifting course or droughts multiple reasons are possible so b if any if we do not find a better answer b can be an answer See, archaeologists' understanding of the decline of the Indus Valley civilization would benefit from a search of signs of earthquake damage. And he said, "Now this is directly mentioned that earthquake was a possible reason. Therefore, if they look for signs of earthquake, it might lead to more uh, grounding for a theory that says that earthquake destroyed the city." So C is a stronger answer than B because C is directly mentioned in the passage. D, cities of Indus Valley civilization should have been. Better prepared for the possibility of a major earthquake doesn't matter, right? Most likely agree with. He's not cared with whether they should have survived. He does not care uh, what should have happened. There's no normative statement in the passage. E. Demise of the Indus Valley civilization was most likely caused by the catastrophic alteration of courses of its major river. Again, most likely. Nothing in the passage to so show that it was most likely, right? the answer would be c we would benefit from the science, search of signs of earthquakes last question and i realize you guys cannot see this question so i will uh actually yep make it so you guys can see this question yeah uh the author would be most likely to agree with which one of the following statements about archaeology kill investigations into the indus valley civilization archaeological data on the civilization were controlled by a small group of scholars no were mentioned it is only in recent years that scholars have gathered evidence sufficient to enable them to reach credible conclusions now this is sort of the essence of the paragraph when it comes to archaeology but he is always talking about recent findings and so that earlier people weren't interested there's no 
way to conclude anything. So because of that reason, B is a possible answer. Albeit not a very strong one. If there's a stronger answer, we'd go for that. But right now, B should be the answer. See the Sumerian tablets that provide evidence of trade. The civilization contain the only known references to the civilization in ancient written records. No, we mentioned they were the only known references. They are the only ones mentioned in the past, but not that they were the only ones in existence. D. While an adequate amount of archaeological data on the civilization has existed for many decades, most of it has been misinterpreted. Uh, they have not existed for many decades, and there's only one instance of misinterpretation. So, no, not in a backing to uh, conclude this. E. The most recent archaeological investigations into the civilization are part of a broader trend in archaeology to avoid over reliance on written evidence. Nowhere mentioned in the passage what the trend is, what the trend ought to be, what the authors are arguing for trends. Nowhere mentioned in the passage. So the answer would be B. Now, one thing I'd like to point out here: there'd be times where you'd think that none of the question, none of the answers, is a strong answer. So that's why the best thing to do in LSAT questions is always to eliminate options and see what you're left with, and choose the best out of the worst. If there aren't questions where you outrightly say all the options are incorrect, you are not being critical. So that you are really being critical uh, when you approach these questions. So these are the answers we got all of them wrong, all of them right. A, C, E, B, C, D. You can check it if you want to. A, C. E, B, C, B. You got all of them right. Then let's move on to critical reasoning. And these are one of my favorite kinds of questions, actually. Ah, uh, so, so there are two ways. A lot of a lot of people and a lot of books will tell you to always start by reading. Read uh, either the passage first. Then the I've done both ways. My accuracy has almost been the same in both of them. So whatever you're more comfortable with, whatever you feel are faster, we do that. So I am more comfortable with reading the question first. So that's how I would approach this. So let's start. The reasoning in the editorial's argument is flawed in that this argument. So we have to find a flaw in the argument. That much we know. Let's read what the argument is. The main contention of Kramer's book is that coal companies are to blame for a region's economic difficulties. Kramer bases this contention primarily on allegations made by disgruntled coal company employees. That the companies made no significant investment in other industries in our region. Yet the companies invested heavily, albeit sometimes indirectly, in road building and manufacturing in the region. Thus, the book's main contention is simply false. Okay, before we read with the options, let's just discuss the argument right here. Uh, it says that uh, Kramer's book argues something. Let's say Kramer's book argues A. This A is based on uh, unhappy employees who used to work for A. Uh, however, the thing that he bases his argument A on is wrong because the complete opposite of it, that is B, is true. So his argument is basically uh, Kramer's book argues A. Uh, however, the complete opposite uh, B argues A on the basis of B. And the, but the complete opposite of B, that is C, is true. Therefore, A must be false. I'm not uh, using the term he strictly argues because I just want to emphasize you do not need to understand whatever he's talking about. But to put in more in context, he's just saying that um, Kramer's book argues that uh, coal companies are, are to blame for a region's economic difficulties, that coal companies are bad. He argues this because employees told him that coal companies haven't invested anything into our city. But however, the coal companies have invested a lot into a city. Therefore, coal companies are not bad for a city. That is basic argument. Let's go over the possible answers. First one, 
concludes now we're finding a flaw remember this concludes that one party is not to blame for a particular outcome merely on the ground that another party is to blame there's only one party the coal companies nothing else b concludes that a person's statement is false made on the ground that if accepted as true it would impugn the reputation of an important industry some people might be gravitated towards this saying that coal is an important industry that much it got right cool but the main argument that he is just saying that the argument is wrong because it hurts the reputation of the company which is saying that the it's an ad hominem attack it's false right because he says that the data is opposite it's not saying that uh the statement is false uh because uh if it was true it would ruin reputation nothing like that c rejects an argument merely on the grounds that the person offering the argument has an ulterior motive for doing so <clears throat> the argument being offered is by crammer right not by the disgruntled coal workers they might have a conflict of interest crammer does not uh and uh, so this thing that he is just basing it on a conflict of interest is false uh d takes a sufficient condition for the coal companies having made significant investments in other industries in the region to be a necessary condition for their having done so now this is a classic argument sufficient versus necessary however in 16 there is nothing sufficient nothing necessary as such mentioned now some of you might feel that investment would have been a sufficient condition which uh, the editor is taking as a necessary condition however uh, not not actually mentioned anywhere in the passage that is sufficient or necessary always look for explicit things first d is a possible answer if we do not find a better answer this will happen a lot of the times so it's important you read all possible answers and lastly e concludes that a person's statement is false merely on the ground that an inadequate argument has been given for it now this is a better answer in my opinion because the argument is that coal uh, company are to blame for the economic difficulties right one of the premises for this is that they haven't invested anything so just because you defeat one of the premises does not mean the conclusion are true right there might be other reasons that it is bad it's not mentioned here of course Uh, the editor uh, it's not mentioned in the editorial but there might be other reasons that are right now understand when i say it's not mentioned in the editorial I'm not saying that you're supposed to apply some external knowledge or some pool of um, mythical uh, ungodly knowledge that's kept somewhere on the internet which you need to read no it's just very logical right conclude that a person statement is false merely on the ground that an inadequate argument has been given for it that's what the author is doing he's saying that the conclusion that the coal companies are bad is false because the argument given for it that they haven't invested is an is inadequate because it's false right this is precisely what the author is doing and that is a false thing to do because the conclusion might nevertheless be right even if they have invested so therefore e is the right answer here and lastly analytical uh, reasoning all right this is a very unique uh kind of question you will not find this in uh any other exam except like a lit makes it a habit to give one paneling question every time i do not understand why though but however this is a very important uh category of questions because you will be coming across these in your lsat and possibly in your a lit so for this i recommend every one of you gets a pen and a pencil and a paper <clears throat> let's start every year a mining company dispatches an engineering team to work for 3 months at grayson mines and for 3 months time at krona mines all six of the months occur from march to november now let's write down march to november Okay. 
uh mass pneumonoid realize that is more than 6 months that is required so you know there's something more going to be there so total of 8 months uh in months that it is not uh, at a mine the team works at the company headquarters so they are working at two mines and a headquarters the team schedule also must follow, must uh, adapt to the following constraints now these constraints are necessary i recommend you write them in shorthand in your notebook or in your rough sheet when you're doing this this make up your own symbols whatever works for you no correct way of doing it just know what the symbols mean and be uniform with your symbols uh the team must work for one month at headquarters between two months working at different mines so we know that between any two mines it's going to work at a at the headquarters now the other condition the team cannot work at the same mine for more than uh three months uh uh we know that so basically let's say they work at grayson mine at work at grayson and for three months they can't do all three of the grayson mine uh, months together there has to be a break in between uh the team must work at uh, grayson mine in august so the month you write down just below august write down grayson is one thing you know for sure and the team must work at krona in october this is another thing you know for sure you write that down so these piece of information which you know for sure are not going to be a lot so that's why a lot of times these questions might be daunting because you feel like oh you a lot of especially people prepare in clat and elect start treating this like a puzzle and immediately from the conditions given try and find out the one solution to this there is no one solution to this multiple possibilities and all the questions are based on multiple possibilities so this which one of the following could be an acceptable schedule uh, understand acceptable not necessarily true but one of the possible solutions for the team from june through october okay so you're not doing uh, march april may here it's only june to october so one of the first things you know that august always has to be grayson or uh, october always has to be krona just look at that august grayson uh, august grayson uh, august krona so you know c is wrong uh, outright uh, just go c is wrong all right then d uh june had uh august grayson october grayson october has to be krona straight up wrong uh august grayson october krona all right so the, all of them meet that now now is three uh they can't be three months together that was one of the contention that three months together and headquarters between any uh while shifting from one mine to another so let's look at a june july august all of them are the same uh mine across three consecutive months so a is therefore wrong b uh grayson headquarters uh grayson headquarters corona possible corona corona grayson uh headquarters corona now here's a problem with this between corona and grayson one month they must work at headquarters right so therefore e is also wrong b is the correct answer for this because this is the only one left this is the only way to solve these questions you look at the one which is left all right no other way to solve these questions 14 which are the following is a month in which the team must work at corona mines now it would be really easy if this straight up just uh, give you october as an answer but october is uh, not an answer in which the team must work at corona mines all right we know september has to be headquarters and now we have to start uh work at least one month at headquarters same mine for more than two months in a row right now this is where trial and error starts these questions are going to take time so the following is the month in which the team must work you understand this is a must work So to solve these questions, you basically negate the premise which is must work. So instead of putting a uh, corona in that month, you put Grayson in that month and see if you are able to come up with an acceptable uh, schedule. All right. Let me just read the conditions once once more. Okay. Let's start March. So to solve this, uh, we put 
uh, Grayson in March, right? And see if we can uh, complete this. Um, we can have a good uh, order despite having Grayson in March. Um, So you will realize that is possible. I will show my ordering. Hopefully you can read my handwriting here. So I hope it is visible. I can only hope that. So you realize that this ordering is possible and notice I have Grayson on March. So we know March is not the answer. So cut that. Uh, now let's go May. Again, we know August is Grayson, we know October is Corona, therefore September must always be headquarters. Therefore, there's an option September, you just cancel that straight out. Uh, let's look at May. Uh, May, in my uh, above one, you notice I also had Grayson in May in the ordering I made. I'll just show that ordering again, right. So again, you know that May is a possibility. So May is wrong. Uh, uh, wait. Yeah, and in my ordering, I again had June to uh, as Grayson. So you know, June is wrong. You know, March is wrong, May is wrong, June is wrong, September is wrong. The only thing you're left with is November. So November must be the right answer. Therefore, November, that is, is the answer. Another thing, there, I just realized there's a shortcut to doing this. And of course, if you look at conditions and you realize there is only one answer to this, don't feel like you have to do all the options. You're very, very certain. Because for example, in this October, we know is Corona. Right. Um, now, November cannot be Grayson. Right? Because you need headquarters in between. No month left. So it makes sense to have Corona in November. It's uh, sort of obvious if you look at it from this way also that November was to be the answer. So now we know a couple of things about this, about how every order should look like. We know August has to be Grace and September has to be headquarters. October and November have to be Corona. Now, which one of the following must be true? The team works at Grace and Mines in June. Now, uh, again, to see whether this is this must be true or not, uh, falsify it. Let's say, what if Corona works there? Now, if you make Corona work in June, you can have headquarters in July. Uh, you can have headquarters in May also, and then you can have March and April as uh, Grayson. So, A is wrong. B, the team works at Grayson Mines in. July. Okay, so July, let's if you put headquarters on July and have uh, Grayson in June, Grayson again in May, headquarters in April and Corona in March. Again, conditions are satisfied. B is false. Uh, C, the team works at headquarters in June. Uh, put any in month, anything. Here. Let's say I put Grayson here. Grayson in June, uh, July headquarters, May. Grayson, April headquarters, March Corona, not necessarily true. D, the team works at headquarters in September. Now we know August has to be Grayson, October has to be Corona, therefore September, which is a month in between, has to be headquarters, headquarters. Therefore D is the right answer, the only possible answer. 16, the team works at Grayson Mine in May, which one the following must be true. Now you have another added condition. It works at Grayson Mine in May. Grayson Mine August is there. Headquarters September is there. Corona October and November is there. Uh, which was following could be true. Again, not must be, could be. Uh, however, the purpose of solving it is the same. Uh, no, actually not. Sorry. For could be true, you just put the condition there and see if you get an answer. For must be true, you negate and see if you get the answer. If you get the answer, then it, the condition uh, cannot be a must be. However, for uh, for could be trues, you just put the condition in and see if you arrive at an answer. So it works in May. The team works in Grace and Mines in March. 
okay if i put grayson in march april has to be headquarters uh may is grayson june i put headquarters um now this is where there's a problem june cannot be grayson because then that will lead to four grayson then there will need to be three grayson june cannot be headquarters because then july will have to be krona and uh, august is uh, grayson and there's no headquarters in between so this is wrong b the team works at grayson mine in april again similar process you put grayson in april may will have to be headquarters uh june will have to be headquarters uh july will have to be krona or june will have to be krona july will have to be headquarters not possible same reason you need uh, headquarters between uh, two different mines so b is also wrong c the team works at grayson mines in june again put grayson in uh, put grayson on june july you put headquarters So you have Grayson, Grayson headquarters, Grayson headquarters, Krona, Krona. April you put headquarters, May you put Krona. You have three Kronas, three Graysons. So uh, this is looking like the correct answer. So it's possible A is the answer. And since it's only asking for could be, right? You know that this is a possible answer. Therefore, D is the answer. Let's move to the last question. The team. Works at Grayson Mine in July. Which of the following could be true? Now I have another conditional thing. Grayson Mine in July. Grayson is already there on August. September has to be headquarters. August, November are Corona. Uh, again, could be true. Just put the condition. If it, if it satisfies the other conditions, it's the answer. The team works at Grayson Mines in April. I put Grayson in April. Uh, Okay, then uh, May has to be headquarters. Uh, uh, March has to be headquarters. June will have to be Krona, but that means June is Krona, July is Grayson. Not possible. You need headquarters in between, right? So A is wrong. B the team was at Grayson Mines in June. Now Grayson in June cannot be there because August is Grayson. You cannot have three continuous mine months as Grayson. So B is wrong. C the team works at headquarters in May. So you put headquarters in May. Uh, again, will not work because then June will have to be uh, either Krona or Grayson. And if it's Krona or Grayson, uh, again two months, three months continuously, and two months without a break. So C is unlikely to be the answer. D. The team works at Krona Mine in March. If in March I put Corona, then in April I put uh, at headquarters. In May I put Grayson. In June again I put headquarters. Then July August Grayson Grayson. All conditions satisfied. Therefore D would be the answer. Yes. So that would bring us to an end of all our sample questions. I'm sorry if this took longer than what most of you would have accepted. I would have thought of, but I. uh no this is very helpful you know i love the fact that pulkit you went over each thing step by step and you know i sometimes wish i hope when i was preparing very many years back for these exams i hope you know i wish there was somebody like you who was mm-hmm. sort of you know walking me through you know how to solve each of these questions step by step i think you know this is incredibly helpful for the people who have joined us today um so you know i'm going to take a couple of questions from the chat box now Uh, so one question that you know a lot of people seem to be asking is what is a great score to get in the LSAT India examination so that you can um, get admission in any of the top universities? Okay, so if you're giving the LSAT uh, nine times out of ten, you're aiming general, right? In my personal opinion, uh, no other college through LSAT is worth going except general. Uh, so and. So just know this: the intake of Jindal is a lot, six uh, hundred plus students uh, every uh, every year, and just keep increasing the number of people they take in. So getting in shouldn't be a shouldn't be a problem for most of you uh, who are here. However, a score you should aim for. Now, the funny thing is, I do not know my own score because you are given a percentile, not a score. And yep. uh, when you're um, 
exam in so it's very difficult for me to say what score you should aim for especially again considering the number of question itself is a variable one like uh, plus minus there's always a plus minus 20 uh question possibilities since all of them can be 29 29 29 29 and you have 20 extra questions yeah. right that just throw off how much marks you should get and say i tell you accuracy you know this is an exam you want to attempt every question of because again even if you are guessing it's fine no negative mark right so i'd say an accuracy around 80% should be very good right so and as far as percentile goes um as long as you're above 70 percentile you should uh, make it through you should uh, make it through jindal no sweat if you want scholarships that's a separate issue because i understand jindal can be expensive it is expensive actually and for a lot of people it's difficult to attend without scholarships so if you're aiming for scholarship above 95 percentile that means keep your accuracy above 90% in all the questions you do you should make it through with a scholarship especially if you're in haryana they have a separate domicel scholarship it just increases the amount a lot uh if you're 95 percentile above you might as well get a full ride in the sense you, your tuition would be free you don't need to pay for accommodation and hostel if you're from haryana and you get a 95 percentile plus in all likelihood yeah so i'm you know i'm quite glad you brought this sort of point up so um, this is very interesting for me because you come from jindal uh, i am an alumnus of national law university delhi so we happen to see very two different sort of you know universities and two different yeah. sort of stuff um so you know i thought it, it's going to be an interesting conversation to have with you and i think you have brought forth a very important point the fact that you know a lot of universities today uh, without taking any names are looking at you know giving a lot of students admission um and there are huge numbers that are getting in um so actually uh, i'm going to take this uh, platform for the people who are joining us uh, who are going to be writing the lsat in their exam this year so um actually uh, view tv by vijay bhumi is actually a knowledge sharing platform of vijay bhumi university uh so we're a university that's based in maharashtra and we're going to be india's first liberal professional university so like i said i come from the national law school um and i've sort of had the good fortune of going through the five year program myself which right now pulkit is embarking on he's finished his first year he's now going to be going into his second um so i've kind of uh, understood and studied what goes right in the system and what goes wrong um and we've also sort of realized that um, especially in the profession because i've been in the profession for a number of years now uh, that as a lawyer it is so important for you to have knowledge about you know more fields than one like um, you know when you start practicing like i'm a practicing advocate in the supreme court and the delhi high court um you realize that it's so important for you as a lawyer that along with law it's important for you to be exposed to fields in like subjects such as humanities um pulkit was really interested in the area of data sciences um i think guys because you guys are going to be entering the legal profession today i must tell you that this entire lockdown i think has been a great period of experimentation for the indian legal profession and the reason why i say that is that because for the first time ever uh you know nobody had ever thought but the supreme court of india the high courts and the various lower courts they have gone into overnight digitization so you have virtual hearings that are happening arbitrations are happening virtually uh, so this kind of has made you realize that now the legal profession is moving closer towards embracing um you know um embracing technology and there're going to be so many opportunities that are going to come in the areas of legal technology and technology laws so you know pulkit like how you spoke about at some point of time you wanted to do data sciences actually if you were to think about it with the kind of opportunities that are opening up in the areas of technology laws and legal technology okay. a combination of data sciences and law will be fantastic because you know we don't have a lot of legal professionals in india who have that kind of you know professional qualifications so this is what we are doing at vijay bhumi university where we give students the option of studying whatever subjects that they want to apart from studying their regular law subjects so you are not uh, somewhere bound by the shackles of that oh, if you're doing the bba llb program or the ba llb program you would only study bba subjects or ba subjects 
So you can be doing the BBA LLB program, but you're free to choose subjects from, you know, the humanities streams. We have a school of data sciences and artificial intelligence at the university. You're free to choose your majors and minors from there. Uh, we have a school of design thinking and communication design. That is something you can choose. We have a business school there, so you can choose a unique business specialization. So I think this is something very interesting and path breaking in the area of legal education. And I think this is what the future of legal education is going to be. Um, so I really think that, guys, this is something that you need to you guys should really explore. Um, we have the offers that are up. Uh, you can go check out the website of the university, Vijayabhumi University, where we have where we truly believe that students are the masters and they decide like they are the ones who are going to curate their own learning pathway and their own degree. Anyway, coming back to um, LSAT. So another question that I had from I'm, the student, I'm, yeah. Just give me a minute. I'm, I'm very sorry. I thought the chat went down, not up. I think oh. I missed a lot of a lot of questions. I'm, I'm very sorry to all of you who who were asking or responding anything. Oh my god! I no, see, no, see. no, 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 uh, no. Terrible. I have been making a note of the questions while he was solving the questions. Okay, okay, uh, he was okay. solving the sample questions. So I'm going to get into mm -hmm. the. So another okay, question okay. that I noticed was this, right? So, you know, a lot of times in these reasoning questions or in a reading comprehension question, you might have a question which has two options which are very close. So what was your thumb rule? How do you eliminate which uh, option? Okay. It's a nice role playing exercise. All right. Especially since you all want to be lawyers. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, so... Uh, what I would think is like I am in a courtroom setting and my opponents making up a certain argument I want to counter. And these two are the possible options I have and the passage the argument is making. Or if it's a support, uh, the support, uh, the argument question, I think my senior is making this argument. And these two are the possible arguments I can make to support my senior counsel's argument, right? So just put yourself in that mindset. And we're like, which one of these would either destroy your opponent's career or get you the most praise from your senior, right? So nice role-playing exercise. And trust me, like if you guys feel that they're two very close options, you're doing it correct, all right? If you always felt that there's certainly one correct answer, you're doing it wrong. You're not critical enough, right? There'd be times where you feel all of them are wrong. All of them just bullshit. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for my language. Uh, but you feel that all of them are just bad, bad answers, right? And uh, you will be forced to pick the best out of the worst, right? Uh, a few just tips and tricks I can give you for certain questions would be uh, one that says uh, find an assumption. Most A lot of questions would be, be assumption-based questions. You just negate the statement you have. If you negate the statement and the argument about still holds true, it's not a necessary assumption. Straight up. Uh, same with uh, what goes against something that goes against the argument. Think if this is true, does the above argument still hold? Or is the above argument just as strong? If the above argument is just as strong, even if uh, what you said is true, not not the answer, right? But when it, it really comes down to the wire, uh, think, just look for very, very minute things. Look for a comma if you feel it changes the meaning of the sentence. Focus on words. Uh, uh, focus on... Uh, Literally just like pick up at alphabets if you have to, because you'll have the time to do it. Pick up at alphabets if you have to. And whichever feels slightly better, right? Whichever feels slightly more relevant to the question. And what you feel the examiner might be looking for, I believe that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Uh, since again, you it's an examiner who made the question. Mark that at the end of it, uh, I'll be lying if I said I did not uh, guess two, three questions uh, during my exam. I definitely did. Right. But it'll always be an educated guess. Uh, since you're confused between the two, go with which one which and you feel you spent too much time on it already. Go with which one of them you feel is strong. Again, no negative marking, not a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. So you know, Apulkit, I noticed that we're running out of time. So would what would be your parting advice to our aspirants, you know, who are two weeks away from the LSAT India exam? Uh, I'll actually first just write my email on the chat box. I know yes, a lot of I'm them are asking you. for my email. Uh, I just write that first. Uh, hopefully this is right. If this is not, I believe Krithik, I can give you the right one, hopefully. Uh, yes, this is it. Uh, up 
piece of parting advice don't stress about it it's probably going to be the easier of the three exams you're going to write and it's going to be less stressful at least you have a lot of time to do it and never be afraid to guess right uh, don't beat yourself up for not knowing questions uh, but do beat yourself up for not knowing questions while you're preparing not when you're giving the exam go back to questions you get wrong one advice i always give uh, and i will continue to give go back to questions you get wrong understand those questions so you do not make the same mistakes like mistakes are good just don't repeat them again and again that's i think some great parting advice coming I mean, from pulkit thank you so much pulkit i think this was a great session that we had today uh which went on for close to about 71 minutes and i think we have covered very very vital parts which are part of you know crucial parts for the prepare preparation of this particular examination uh for our guys here uh, i'm sure a couple of you must also be writing the clack exam so i must tell you guys uh, we have something called the clack masterclass series that is going on as well uh so on tuesday at 6:30 pm i have shared the link earlier you guys can join us for our clack masterclass series where we're going to specifically talk we'll be talking about how to crack the gk section in clack uh, we're going to be joined by mohammad asadullah sharif who is the founder of clack gyan and an al alumnus of nalsar hyderabad so i hope if you guys are writing it i think it'll be super helpful for you so please do join us on the session thank you so very much again pulkit i think this was incredibly helpful for everyone and it truly made me realize that i wish we had someone like you during our time to sort of walk us through the of That's very high praise no no i think it was truly i think it was amazing uh thank you so very much everybody uh for joining us this evening on a sunday evening to take our time and to discuss this with us i hope each of you enjoyed the session i hope to see some of you on our tuesday session so here's our signing off see you on our next episode of new tv thank you so much pulkit again stay safe everyone mm -hmm.